very heavy day. Um, so I'm going to, like all long runs, you have to start gradually. So I'm going to start gradually today. And uh, this is the first of four lectures um, on the general topic of the physics of heavy chromium superconductivity. And uh, I think I'm probably the only person talking about heavy fermions in this school. And so I'll spend quite a lot of time introducing you to some of the physics of the normal state. Um, uh, what comes next? A picture. A picture of a superconductor, actually. Uh, that's mis this, is, was, this is probably mislabeled. This is probably a, a crystal of cerium cobalt. Indian five, but they look much the same. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll be telling you quite a lot about the experimental aspects of these systems. Um, uh, ma many, many theorists in condensed matter physics begin like their lives in thinking they want to become particle physicists. And particle physicists believe in a reductionist approach to physics. But actually, this is a field which has been driven predominantly by experiment. And, uh, uh, and many times you can't use a totally reductionist approach to things and we're still discovering things today. There's an unfinished field of physics. Okay, so my first lecture will be on heavy fermions and what is known as the condo lattice. Um, so I want you to ask me questions as we go along. Okay? Um, uh, they'll keep us all awake, if nothing else. Um, so I'm going to give you a, four lectures uh, first will be on heavy fermions and the condo lattice. I know it's impossible to keep to strict schedules. This is just a rough outline. Um, I'll introduce you to the to the uh, debate of glue versus fabric. The whole issue of whether you can think of pairing as being driven by a, a pairing boson as it is so beautifully in conventional superconductivity. And I'll give you examples of superconductors that are good in that they probably are well described by weak interactions, a Cooper instability of a Fermi liquid, and bad and ugly uh, superconductors which defy our current understanding altogether. Um, uh, I'll give you in lecture three or sometime around then, uh, BCS meets condo. Um, I'll tell you how an approach not unlike the BCS theory of superconductivity gives you a, a fairly good working theory of the normal state of the condo lattice, uh, but it has many deficiencies despite this, one of which is it doesn't explain superconductivity. Um, and I'll go on sometime towards the end of the lecture course telling you about how it can be improved, uh, but how there's still a lot more work to be done. Okay. My main objective in this sequence of talks is not to uh, fill in your full education on heavy fermions, but perhaps to excite a few of you uh, uh, into this aspect of superconductivity and its connection with all the other areas of strongly correlated superconductors. Um, this is, these are some, these will be the notes. Everything will be on the notes except the user ID and the password of my book. Um, uh, this book is soon to be taken down, so get it while it's still there, free. Um, uh, and there are some chapters relevant to, to um, this course there. Um, there's a, a now rather old review of uh, heavy fermions that I wrote in 2006. Um, uh, an earlier version of this uh, course, mainly focusing on the, the physics of heavy fermion systems. And uh, this is a, a classic book, Houston's book on the condo effect of heavy fermions now. 21 years old, uh, uh, theory of quantum liquids. And these are some references relevant to the more research aspects of physics that I'll come to later. So, introduction to heavy fermions and the condolats. And I'm going to go easy on you uh, uh, in this uh, lecture. Um, we'll be a bit more demanding next time round. Um, so, magnetism and superconductivity, I thought I'd tell you a bit about the history of the field. I don't know whether anyone has talked about the history. Um, what the history teaches you is that in each era, the community thought they'd wrapped it up. And in each era, the community was making stupid mistakes 
and there are major new discoveries to be made. And since that's been true for a very long time, it's probably also true today. Okay? And so that's why it's important for you guys to be stimulated to come up with new ideas that challenge the status quo. Okay? So, Mactism and superconductivity, these are two <coughs> venerable areas of condensed matter physics. And for a very long time, they were thought to be completely separate aspects of physics. <coughs> the Weiss theory of ferromagnetism is, uh, is 100, almost 110 years old. Uh, the discovery of superconductivity, uh, just over 100 years. And of course, magnetism goes back 2,000 years. The ancient mariners have been using old stones to navigate their way across the, uh, uh, across the world for a very long time. Uh, but it was really only with the advent of quantum mechanics that magnetism could be understood. Um, and there's a famous theorem discovered by Bohr and independently later after the Great War by Van Leeuwen, known as the Bohr Van Leeuwen theorem. Has anyone heard of this? It's okay, it's, a, it's basically a very simple theorem, but it's very bold in its, in, in its, uh, in its uh, claim. It claims that classical physics is unable to account for any form of magnetism in equilibrium, be it dire, feral, or para magnetism. They're all impossible, classically. And the reason is that uh, you can induce magnetism and the effect of the magnetic field just by introducing a vector potential. And, uh, of course, this means that you can just absorb the moment, the shift in the in the, in the vector potential by a, a, a change of variables of the momentum. And since you've just got a flat integral over all the canonical momenta in the classical partition function, uh, a, a does nothing to your Hamiltonian, and therefore they're in equilibrium, there's no response. In out of equilibrium, there's of course a response, but not in equilibrium. And uh, of course, one major breakthrough was the discovery of spin. Pauli discovered the concept of spin uh, and of course it was used by him to explain together with uh, exclusion principle the susceptibility of metals. In fact uh, at that time uh, there was great disappointment when they realized that metals could not be described by einstein bohr statistics, Bose-Einstein, Einstein-Bohr statistics, Bose-Einstein statistics. Uh, and Pauli himself wrote a note to Schrödinger saying how disappointed he was that, that his theory of the Pauli susceptibility worked because electrons were fermions. And the field has been paying for this ever since because unless you work in cold atoms, you can't use the word Einstein very easily in condensed matter physics. Um, uh, on the other end of things, uh, it was discovered that superconductivity is a different form of Magnetism. It's perfect diamagnetism. And uh, this aspect, the, the expulsion of flux, was unknown until uh, Meissner and Oxenfeld's uh, famous discovery in the early 1930s. And so between uh, the discovery of superconductivity in 1933, there are countless papers trying to understand superconductivity as a phenomenon of zero resistance rather than the phenomenon of perfect diamagnetism. And, uh, of course, this is what stimulated London, uh, actually the London Brothers, in the 1930s to propose that superconductivity was a kind of rigidity of the wave function. 1957, the BTS theory, um, this is really a microscopic theory, but was built on many earlier pieces of work. In fact, uh, uh, Schrieffer uh, always used to recount uh, how uh, they were always told by Bardeen to go back and look at London's book and study it carefully because the key idea was in it somehow. Um, and of course they put down their microscopic wave function, uh, but many of the key ideas were already in London's work and Lambda Ginsburg theory that came afterwards. And bringing you up to the, uh, uh, the early 1960s, in the early 1960s the um, community began to become aware of of local moment, the formation of local moments in metals and their effects. And one of the things, and this was, anyone know why it took to the 1960s to study local moments in metals? Seemed 
obviously local movements were proposed by Heisenberg in some sense long before, so why was it only in the 1960s that they could start studying that? You guys capturing one idea? Any other ideas? Why did it take so long? The problem is they're always there, you can never get rid of them. We live on an iron planet, and so almost all metals contain contain iron atoms which are invariably magnetic moments. And so if you can't get rid of them, you don't know what their effect is. Um, and it was only by the time of the early 60s that you could make metals with sufficient, sufficient purity to get rid of the iron atoms and then redoubt them with other stuff to see what the effect would be. Okay. And one of the uh, things that were discovered in the 1960s was something, the origin of the so-called condo resistance minimum, the effect of scattering of local moments. They'd seen it for 30 years, but they had no idea what it was. It's only when you have really pure samples that you can get rid of the crud effects and then study them carefully. And one of the effects that was discovered in the early 1960s was that small amounts of magnetic moment are killers for superconductivity. Uh, it used to be that you could buy lead in hardware stock stores, maybe you still can at Home Depot, um, and uh, hardware quality lead, um, uh, you can cool it down, it goes superconducting. Uh, uh, but if you start to put magnetic impurities into it, uh, TC goes down very rapidly. And uh, here's a little plot from uh, a famous paper of Matthias, Sura and Coram, which, uh, which they looked at the, the effect of putting gadolinium into, um, into uh, lanthanum. And 1% gadolinium had completely killed the superconductivity. So this led to the uh, universal dictate that spin paramagnetism is bad for superconductivity. And if small amounts of magnetism are bad for superconductivity, then obviously large amounts must be even worse. Okay? Um, and this completely led the field uh, astray. And it led to a terrible tragedy in the early 1980s. And let me tell you about that tragedy, of course. In the 70s, sorry. In 1972, helium-3 uh, was found to go superfluid. And in fact, for 10 years, theorists had been predicting that it would go superfluid, although they'd overestimated the TC. They'd also developed a marvelous theory of anisotropic pairing in superfluids, D-wave and P-wave pairing. And uh, in the early 60s, they had uh, analyzed the effect of hardcore repulsions and Van der Waals type repulsions, and come to the conclusion that the most likely attractive channel for helium-3 would be the D-wave channel. And so all the papers for a whole decade uh, referred to it as, as if it were to occur as a D-wave superconduct, D-wave superfluid, even though they had uh, discovered that ferromagnetic fluctuations drive P-wave pairing. And it developed a whole framework for discussing P-wave pairing. And of course, when it came along, it turned out that the NMR clearly showed it was a P-wave superfluid. And so the theorists learned their lesson. D-wave is a very bad idea. And uh, this was to haunt them later. Uh, another thing that happened was that at Bell Labs, they studied this anti-ferromagnetic system, uranium beryllium 13. They cooled it down. They made cerium beryllium 13, a whole bunch of beryllium 13 compounds. They're marvelous cubic materials. Uh, with uh, these elaborate clusters of beryllium-13 uh, making up sort of super atoms in between. And they keep the magnetic atoms far apart so that they uh, localize, um, uh, excepting to the great disappointment of the experimentalists, uh, this group here, Buch et al., uh, who published this, this work B two years after their, uh, they were studying this, um, they uh, tried to look for what they were really interested in, the magnetic ordering below 1 Kelvin, and nothing happened. And uh, to their great irritation, it went superconducting at 0.97. And uh, mysteriously, when you put a huge, what then was a very huge field on it, TC only went down by 0.3 Kelvin. And uh, uh, this was very strange to them, and they came to the conclusion that it can't be intrinsic, uh, that the superconductivity was in fact the effect of uranium filaments throughout the sample. You couldn't actually do specific heat measurements of these low temperatures in Bell Labs in those days. The sample was sent to Berkeley uh, for measurements, and the individual in question who was supposed to do the measurement was more interested in spin glasses, and so never got measured. 
In fact, it became known at Bell Labs as the example of mistakes you can make uh, when making the faulty conclusion that you might have an electronically mediated superconductor. Um, <coughs> so it wasn't until 1979 that, uh, that someone uh, raised the flag, and that person was Frank Dicklich, who discovered another material, cerium copper 2 silicon 2, which is also paramagnetic with local moments. And uh, uh, this system went superconducting, unfortunately, I'm using the bottom of my Oh, it's actually okay. Anyway, when superconducting just below one Kelvin uh, had a very tiny, very large linear specific heat, and therefore very small Fermi temperature. And this is the conclusion in this paper, which had a very, very hard time being published. Um, uh, Stakelish's own uh, postdoc advisor uh, vehemently opposed this piece of work and took his name off the paper. Uh, Matthias blocked Stakelish's work and came out in front of him, in front of the German, German audience, and said that he thought that this was uh, basically nonsense. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, they pushed on, they measured the specific heat capacity and found these large discontinuities, which told them it was a bulk phenomenon. And, uh, uh, and there's a rather interesting remark here. This is in 1979. This suggests that cerium copper 2, silicon 2, behaves as a high temperature superconductor. Um, uh, uh, and uh, cannot be described by the conventional theory of superconductivity, by which they mean phonon mediated superconductivity. And so, um, uh, uh, when word of this got back to Bell Labs, um, the community there said, well, you know, they couldn't reproduce the phenomenon. Uh, turned out, serum copper to silicon 2 is very hard to get it to go superconducting, you have to prepare it in just the right way. And they concluded that, in fact, it was like that old material they studied 10 years ago, which also was, could have been thought to be a, uh, an electronic superconductor, but wasn't because of uranium filaments. And uh, the remark was made to a passerby, Mr. Hans Rudi Ocht, who'd already been working on heavy fermion compounds, and they asked, well, did anyone measure the specific heat capacity? And there was a sort of, mm, can't quite remember. So they remeasured it. And this is what they measure, this beautiful discontinuity in the specific heat capacity. And uh, it's a rather fascinating material. The resistivity monotonically rises until just before it goes superconducting, it plummets from a value of around 250 micron centimeters to zero. It never goes coherent, this metal. And in fact, it's still not understood to this day. Yeah, we'll come back to it later. But this was reproducible. Many, many labs could reproduce this uh, uh, result, and it became the canonical material that established the reproducibility of heavy fermion superconductivity. It's just a, a pity that it wasn't discovered 10 years earlier, because it would have occurred at the same time as helium-3 went superfluid. The history would have been a very different history. We'd be 10 years ahead of where we are now. Yes, Andre. Is it known why Matthias was so much I don't know. And, and so, can, yes, question. Sorry, the thing is, so helium-4, that is superfluid, right? Helium-3 is also superfluid. Helium-4 is a beautiful bosonic superfluid. Uh -huh. yeah. So that was, that, that was uh, discovered back in the 1930s by Capi Piotr Kapitza and a group at St. Andrews University. And that could be understood as strongly interacting bosons. But it wasn't until the BCS theory came along in the 1950s that people could think of of fermion pairs condensing. And that immediately led to notions of, well, how can we generalize this? And so the, the two great generalizations were to nu nucleonic matter, the fact that nucleons are paired inside nuclear matter, and uh, which, as you know, explains the difference, the odd even difference, the reason why uranium-235 uh, uh, can be used for bombs and uranium-238 uh, cannot is purely due to pairing energy. Um, uh, and uh, the other application was to, to superfluid fermion, to fermion fluid, so which helium-3 was a well-established Fermi liquid by this time. Okay. Actually, uh, it's, it's quite remarkable to read the papers of 1969-61. There was about three or four groups that came to the conclusion that helium-3 was a very good candidate. Yeah. So anyway, in some sense, this was the beginning of a whole new era, the notion that 
magnetic fluctuations or spin or something to do with spin fluctuations can drive unconventional superconductivity. This uh, picture is a modified version of, a, of an outreach slide due to, uh, to, due, due to Miyake. And, uh, uh, and of course, it's a rather abstract axis along the uh, y, y axis. That's research area. I don't know how to quantify that. But anyway, there's a lot of interest in this region of overlap. Okay. Of course, the notion of magnetism is a very, very loose idea. Okay, magnetic interactions. And one idea is that it's just like a magnetic phonon. Uh, but another idea that we'll be coming back to is that actually the Hilbert space of the spins becomes entangled with the charge degrees of freedom of the surrounding metal to form the pegs. And we'll be discussing that in more detail also. So, so I think this is a remarkable convergence of two fields. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm quite sure that despite the fact that we, you can see all of these discoveries coming along uh, in short order, the various heavy fermion superconductive conductors, uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, by the time cuprate superconductivity was discovered in 1986, the notion that D-way pairing drives, uh, anti-ferromagnetic fluctuations drive D-way pairing is already uh, stimulated by uh, heavy fermion systems, and so it was there and ready to go by the time cuprate superconductivity came along. Although many people didn't believe that D-way pairing would be robust against disorder, and it took a further five years of uh, of discussion before five or six before everyone came to the conclusion that these were indeed D-way superconductors. Um, uh, TC has slowly crept up in the heavy fermion systems at the highest TC on my list there is up to almost 20 Kelvin. Uh, and of course, most recently, we've had the iron-based superconductors, which at the moment are believed to be S plus minus superconductors. Although, uh, if you were to take a lesson from previous discoveries of the past, um, you shouldn't be sure about the pairing uh, symmetry for the first five or six years after the discovery has been made. Um, and so S plus minus, although uh, everyone is certain about it, now may change in the not too distant future, who knows? Um, uh, so anyway, so, so much for this conversion of two fields. Let me now bring you on to this discuss, discuss, discussion of how this is connected with the periodic table. Okay. Um, and let's talk about electrons on the brink of localization. Um, uh, as I scanned through this, uh, the um, outline for this uh, school, I noticed that Almost every talk is embedded in K space. But chemistry exists in real space. Okay? And in fact, it's real space aspects of uh, these systems that play a major role, in particular, the capability of electrons to localize as interactions become strong. And uh, in a very loose sense, if you want to look at the atoms themselves, of course, you can you can drive even hydrogen atoms into a strongly correlated regime if you make them dilute enough. Um, but inside metals, at least, in elemental metals, the most strongly interacting electrons are those that are inside the core states of the D shell or the F shell. Um, the most localized uh -huh. 3D D, D shells are the 3D shells. And that's because they have no node in their spatial wave function. They're basically hydrogenic wave functions, the D electrons, 3D. And uh, that's because when n is equal to L, uh, when n is equal to L plus 1, you get a hydrogenic wave function. So if you now go up to the F shells, then 4F also has a hydrogenic wave function and drops even further inside the outer uh, shell of the uh, inner gas shell, and so these are even more localized than transition metals. In between them are the actinide 5Fs. And so it makes sense to reorganize the uh, central rows of the periodic table in this order. And this was first done by Kometko and Smith in 1983. They reorganized it this way around. Um, uh, you can see there's a squeezing factor needed here because uh, L equals L equals uh, 2 for the D electrons, so there's now there's 10. Uh, 10 uh, electrons you can put into the D shell 
whereas L equals 3 for the f and x is about 14 that you can put in here. But already there's a very nice trend amongst the elements when you do things this way, because the, um, and this trend is connected with the fact that localization increases vertically and also increases horizontally. Why does the localization of the electrons increase as you go from left to right? Anyone know? That's chemistry. Oh, God. I never learned that. Didn't teach me that in fields one, two, or three. Anyone know? Nobody knows? I and Z, yes, as simple as that. It's called the lanthanide contraction. And as Z gets larger, the radius of the uh, D state or F state gets narrower. And so what happens is that uh, all of these F electrons on the right hand side here localize in four magnetic moments. The Hund's interactions lock them up together and make very, very large magnetic moments. Uh, and it's those magnetic moments that are uh, so important to. Uh, the new revolution in electric motors and magnets that occurred in the last 20 years. Because one of the great discoveries is that if you put uh, anisotropic uh, rare, earth, uh, rare, rare earth atoms inside iron, is it converts it from a Heisenberg-like to an Ising-like magnet. And the Ising character of today's modern magnets means that they are much more robust and have much higher fields. Um, and so that's sort of one of the aspects of magnetism here. Um, uh, neodymium plays a major role in modern high field uh, iron based uh, magnets. On the bottom left hand side, you have superconductors. These are all, these are the, the D electrons in lutetium, hafnium, yttrium, zirconium, all very delocalized. Niobium is a very good superconductor, okay, in this elemental form. A phonon based superconductor. Okay. And what we're going to be interested in is the crossover region. Okay. And it's in this region that very interesting things happen. And so cerium is not quite magnetic and not quite delocalized. And this is where a whole group of heavy electron materials occur. There are also actinide uh, uh, heavy Fermi systems containing uranium, neptunium and plutonium. And if you take this very literally, then interestingly enough, manganese and iron are at the crossover region. Of course, this is uh, uh, very oversimplified here, but at least it gives us the idea that there may be a diversity of new ground states in the region where magnetism and itinerancy are fighting with one another. Um, and uh, one example that we'll come back to is this exotic member of the so-called 115 superconductors, Neptunium, Aluminium-2, Palladium-5. This is a fascinating heavy fermion superconductor because it's paramagnetic right down to TC. It has a Curie susceptibility all the way down to TC when it goes superconducting, and the local moments vanish as it goes superconducting. We'll come back to that. Um, uh, of course, there are many other examples, F-electron systems, D electron systems, the nictites, the cuprates. What we'd really like to know is the rules that would help us navigate around the periodic table and find the next island of high temperature superconductivity. Of course, if we fall into the trap of previous generations, we will assume that these are the only ones. Okay. These are the only ones because we understand these, we know why they're special, there can't be anything else. Well, that would be a, a dumb mistake to make. There are surely other superconductors out there, and since we have such a poor understanding of the field, we can't tell you what governs TC. Nobody can tell you whether 92 or 140 Kelvin is the maxed out value in the periodic table. We just don't know. And so from an engineering point of view, we don't understand these materials well enough to tell, to tell whether there are major discoveries to be made in the near future. Why study, then, low TC materials? It doesn't make sense. Obviously, you should go for the highest TC materials. They're the ones that can have applications. Well, we can maybe take a cue out of the biologist's uh, research book. Biologists are interested in improving agriculture, improving crop yields. And so what you should do is you should make better crops. You should breed 
new strains of crops. But this wasn't where the great breakthrough in genetics occurred in the 20th century. It was by studying something that's completely useless for crops. It was by studying the fruit fly. Even today, we don't eat fruit flies. Um, but they led to a major breakthrough in our understanding of genetics. Long before DNA was discovered, the basic principles of genetics and breeding were, were worked out from breeding flies. In a similar way, it may be that the route to high TC does not lie by directly studying high temperature superconductors, but also studying other superconductors that can teach us the rules which govern these unusual forms of pairing. And so this is a new era of mysteries. And of course, uh, one of the mysteries that is staring you in the face here, it's this linear resistivity of the cuprate superconductors. That linear resistivity repeats itself in several other materials, including heavy electron superconductors and iron-based superconductors. And we still don't understand it. So um, now I'd like to, um, what time did I start, Leo? 3.45. 3.45, okay, very good. And I'm expecting, when do we stop? 5.50. okay. But half an hour for questions is the, okay, I'm doing fine. That's good. Okay, very good. Got any questions? Okay, so now I'm going to give you a cartoon introduction to heavy fermions, okay? Uh, and I'm willing to go into details of any aspect that looks too cartoonish. So please say this is, put your hand up, say that looks ridiculous, can't you provide more details? I'm happy to do that. Okay. Okay. If by contrast you just want to look at cartoons, then I'm happy to keep going. Okay. All right, so there's our cartoon of a spin. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, the decoupled spin degrees of freedom that you see in the paramagnetic state of heavy electron systems provides the basic fabric of the heavy electron physics. That's to say, the Hilbert space of these local moments is what dominates the low temperature physics. And this is our cartoon. In fact, very important to realize that these systems are strongly spin-orbit coupled. Okay. Let me give you an example. Which one? No, no. to the right. Oh. Let me give you an example. <laughs> oh, sorry. People are already sleeping. Uh, so, let me give you an example. Cerium. Cerium in most compounds exists in the three plus form. And that means, uh, in fact, that it's in a 4F1 configuration. There's one F electron in the F shell. This has got L equal to 3 and S equal to half. Okay? Right. Um, but spin orbit coupling means that the spin and the angular momentum like to align in opposite directions. And so it, they couple up to form a state of J equal to 3 minus a half equals 2 and a half, 5 halves. Okay? The spin orbit coupling in this system is around 0.6 electron volts. It's a very large number. Okay. One electron volt is about 10,000 Kelvin. So this is about 6,000 Kelvin, way above room temperature. Okay. And so what this means is that the uh, original 14 states here are split into Multiplets of J equals 5 halves and J equals 7 halves, and this is around 0.6 volts. Okay? Now, of course, that means you've got six degenerate states here. Those six degenerate states are not degenerate when you put the atom inside an intermetallic system. Okay? If it's in a cubic environment, they split apart into a quartet and a doublet, like that. If it's in a tetragonal environment, they split into uh, three separate doublets, Kramer's doublets. Okay? And this is the simplest example, cerium 3 plus. Okay? Now, the great thing about this is that you can detect magnetic moments. One of the great tragedies of 
condensed matter physics, we can very easily detect magnetic moments, but we can't detect pairs. Unfortunately, we don't have a pairometer. But we do have a spinometer, a magnetometer, and the way we know they're there is that we see a Curie vice susceptibility. Okay? Uh, if we didn't have the ability to measure magnetic moments this way, we would have been very much delayed in our understanding of magnetic materials. Okay, it's the basic thing. And so what makes these systems so interesting is that these local moments coexist with the surrounding electron C. Okay? And that surrounding electron C interacts <coughs> with the local moments. And we'll come back to discussing what's happening here. But typically, if you have, uh, uh, we just, if we just simplify it and think about it as just a two-fold degenerate ground state, as it would be in a tetragon environment, with one electron sitting in it, um, then what can happen is that electrons, is that this electron can hop out into the conduction sea and hop back in. And every time it does so, this is a kind of super exchange process. Okay? And those super exchange processes um, mean that the energy of single configurations are lowered, uh, or that you have a anti-ferromagnetic coupling. And the curious thing about this anti-ferromagnetic coupling is that although it starts out as being weak, uh, as you start to include the effect of high-frequency spin fluctuations, it scales to strong coupling. And in fact, uh, it's this scaling to strong coupling that's responsible for the famous resistance minimum that was discovered uh, back in the early 1930s uh, is present in, when you look at the resistivity of gold or copper or silver, you see it has this resistance minimum. And this is due to the presence of ion atoms. Okay. Ion magnetic moments which scatter the electrons, and that scattering starts to increase as you go to lower temperatures, and so it comes above the phonon scattering. And that's the origin of this resistance minimum. And it was Kondo who understood that this was due to the spin exchange or, or the super exchange interaction with the conduction electrons. And uh, as you go to lower temperatures, this coupling grows and eventually the dimensionless coupling constant, the product of J times the density of states, grows to a value of order one, at which point you can no longer do weak coupling perturbation theory. So this is one of the first examples of a strongly interacting problem where you cannot get by with just doing weak coupling perturbation theory. Uh, what we now know is that for the single impurity condom model is that effectively it scales on to strong coupling. And this then leads at low temperatures to the formation of a powerly power magnet. The characteristic scale where this crossover from weak to strong coupling occurs is the condom temperature and it's exponentially related to the coupling constant in a fashion rather similar to the TC in BCS theory. In fact, when this was first seen in the early 1960s, in the mid-1960s, uh, physicists got very excited and thought it might be something to do with superconductivity. Um, and then they realized it wasn't, and it took 10 more years to understand the nature of this crossover. Nowadays, we understand it very, very well. This is known as the Kondo problem. You can solve this model exactly using beta ansatz. You can follow it using numerical methods. You can do approximate solutions. We understand it very, very well. It's a very nice example of a completely solved, strongly interacting problem. It's a single impurity. Um, I'm just going to talk about it qualitatively at the moment. The important point is that the spin becomes entangled with the conduction electrons and it forms a single ground state which has no residual entropy and therefore the think back here and therefore the um, uh, and therefore the uh, uh, the ground state has no entropy satisfies Nernst's theorem and uh, in particular you can measure the entanglement entropy of a local moment. And one of the ways you do that is using... I'm still getting a lot of feedback. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I've got to keep away from you. <laughs> um, it, it's using a, an entanglement meter. Uh, of course, uh, the, spit, the entanglement entropy meter is common, more commonly known as the specific heat capacity 
And as you know, uh, the specific heat capacity measures the amount of uh, heat absorbed by the system, which can be regarded as also the loss of entanglement entropy. If you integrate this up, C over T dt, um, then that must give you back log T, log 2, because you've got log 2 entropy in a spin one half problem. And in fact, in the solution to the condo problem, the uh, characteristic uh, amount of entropy under the curve up to TK is about half log 2. Okay. Also, the scale of the linear specific heat and the power magnet forms must therefore be of order 1 over TK because the area is of order 1, log 2. And since the width is TK, the height has to be 1 over TK. And so immediately you see here that systems where this scale of entanglement becomes very, very low must have very large linear specific heat capacities. And so in a nutshell, that's the basic idea of a heavy fermion. Accepting this is just for one impurity, not for a lattice of them. And the hard part comes when you start to think about a lattice of such local moments. And in fact, uh, uh, from the theoretical perspective, and this already came after experiments, the bold idea that the condo effect could persist into a lattice was proposed by uh, Sebastian Doniak in 1977. This was in response well, actually, it wasn't really his idea. Many people had the idea before him. In particular, probably the very first, first person to mention this was Neville Mott. But Doniak really expanded on the idea in detail. And he thought about uh, the condo lattice model. Again, this is, although studied first in, in detail in the 1970s, you can trace this model back to the 1950s. Um, uh, Kasuya wrote down this model in 1951, albeit with a ferromagnetic coupling here. Um, and here's the basic cartoon idea of Doniak's hypothesis. Uh, the point is that there are really two scales in this problem. One is the so-called RKKY scale, and the other is the condo scale that governs the formation of singlets. So one is this condo temperature, which is exponentially dependent on the coupling constant. The other is the RKKY scale, which is determined by J squared times rho, and it's an oscillatory function of distance. And these two scales compete with one another in the condo lattice. Uh, they don't compete in the single impurity because there isn't any RKKY interaction there. And so then if TRKKY is bigger than TK, you're going to form a, a power magnet that ultimately anti ferromagnetically orders. And if TRKKY is smaller than TK, then what will happen is that local moments will become screened. And uh, this is then the modern picture of the condo lattice uh, is not all self-explanatory, but let me just tell you a few things about it that weren't actually in Doniak's original uh, hypothesis. First of all, each local moment is screened. You can think of that as having bound a hole to it. It's bound a hole to it, and that means it forms a kind of positive background. This then liberates a a one spin degree of freedom that forms a mobile heavy fermion, and the Fermi surface gets larger. In fact, Doniak studied a one-dimensional model, uh, and uh, uh, in a very insightful uh, uh, statement, commented that there should be a second order transition at zero temperature as the exchange is varied between an anti ferromagnetic ground state for weak J and a condo like <coughs> state in which the moment, local moments are quenched. I don't really know how he knew it would be second order. Um, uh, you look back at the original paper, there was nothing really there to tell you whether it would be second or first order. Uh, he had a simplified 1D model, which perhaps indicated that might be the case. Uh, but it was really a, a wonderful insight. And we now know that there are many examples of anti ferromagnetic heavy electron systems that when you squeeze them or you tune them, uh, to the point where they delocalize, there's a quantum critical point that separates the anti from um, the uh, Is there, any, spe uh, is there yeah. any specific reason that uh, it's anti ferromagnet Because it can be ferromagnet, it depends on those That's right. So I think the, I think the, I suppose one reason is if you look at the RKKY interaction, at zero separation, it's ferromagnetic. But typically, once you get to one, atomic lattice spacing, it's changed sign and become anti-ferromagnetic. So typically, 
anti it typically it favors antiferromagnetism. But you might have a very special structure, a 1D structure or something that would favor, for other reasons, a ferromagnetic behavior. But I think it, the notion was that generically, Q will not be zero and therefore it would be an antiferromagnet. Good question. And so, um, yeah, just coming back to this, of course, this then means that you can think about a condor lattice in which, in some sense, the coupling becomes very large on every single site. This is a very naive picture that you have here, lots of difficulties with it. Um, but then the basic notion is that you can have entangled spins and electrons, and this then leads to the heavy fermion state, the heavy fermion metal. Uh, here are many examples of heavy electron systems, cerium aluminium-3, the first heavy electron metal to be studied. All of them show this rising resistivity as you lower the temperature associated with this incoherent scattering of local moments. But when you cool them down further, their resistivity turns downwards dramatically and they form a coherent state. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is that the resistivity for the T squared behavior at low temperatures, this is characteristic of a so-called Fermi liquid. But there are many other entangled states that are possible. You can have new kinds of superconductors. And one of the things to point out is that if you integrate up to 4 Kelvin, you've already got log 2 in uranium beryllium 13, a large fraction of log 2. Um, so the spin or the local magnetic degrees of freedom are somehow entangling to form the superconductor. Now, yeah, sure. Please. So spins are entangled. What happens to the orbital of the spatial part of the electron wave function? Okay, I, I'd be deliberately very vague about that here. Um, so, so, in fact, Perhaps the simplest case to think about would be the very special case where you have very strong coupling, J, the dominant interaction of the problem. Let's write down the Hamiltonian. Let's just discuss it. I'm going to come back to this. So in a very simplified model, we have the spin density of the electrons coupled to the spin of the local moment. In this simple model, I forgot about spin orbit coupling and all the k-dependence of J and everything else. But you can see that in the simplest case where I, this is a, a bandwidth of width W, in the simplest case where um, J is much, much bigger than W, okay, you'll just form a singlet on every single side. Right? This is a very extreme case. Okay? Once you form that signal that here's the big spin and it's got a local moment there, it's quite clear that that setup will be an insulator. Okay? Now, what you can do to that insulator is you can dope it. You can, have, you can add extra electrons. If you add an extra electron to this guy here, it has to go in and form a singlet with the other electrons bound there, and as a result, it liberates a local moment. So this then becomes an unpaired local moment at that point. But of course, because of the residual hopping from side to side, this unpaired local moment can actually hop from side to side. And so it becomes a mobile heavy electron. Now this isn't a limit that J is much, much bigger than W. So in this limit, the coherence length of this singlet is basically one lattice constant. The question then arises, well, what will happen to it as I let J become much, much smaller? Okay. Uh, and, and, so, and so what typically will happen is that that characteristic length scale will have to increase. Okay. How big it will become is a question that requires more study. One of the issues that came about in trying to generalize from the single impurity to the lattice was the issue of, of whether there'll be enough electrons to screen the local moments. Uh, and I'll perhaps come back to that later. Okay. But the coherence length, it's, it's good to think of this in terms of a kind of coherence length picture. Because it is no question that these local moments in some sense overlap uh, 
and, uh, and can coexist with one another. Um, but to cut to the chase, uh, if there is a coherent length or a screening length for a condo problem, for a single impurity, that for a single impurity, you would probably associate that length with Vf divided by Tk. But it's not at all clear that's the right length scale for a condo lattice. Uh, in fact, what should you do here? The, the condo temperature is not significantly renormalized, but what happens to Vf? Also, there's momentum conservation. It's very important in the lattice. So probably a better answer to this would be that in the lattice, you'd have to put in something more like Vf divided by the square root of the condo temperature and the bandwidth. And I'll come back to why that's the case later. Okay. Perhaps another way of thinking, okay, I, I can depress a long time on this, but I, this is the first attempt to answer your question. Okay. So before I come back to heavy fermions, um, I wanted to address this whole issue of localization of electrons. Because this debate about what happens when interactions become strong has been one that has, has concerned the condensed matter community for more than 50 years. Um, and so I paraphrased it of Landau versus Ken Wilson, this is just to make you think. Uh, Critic and in particular, uh, want to discuss the whole issue of criticality as a driver of new states of matter. Okay. And one of the main states of our modern understanding of, of metals is the is Landau's Fermi liquid theory. And based on Landau's remarkable intuition that you might use adiabaticity despite the fact that metals are gapless. Of course, using adiabaticity for a gap system makes a lot of sense. But using adiabaticity for a gapless system is very paradoxical. Um, nevertheless, Landau argued, based on ideas uh, that, well, might even be wrong, um, but based on the idea of thinking about, thinking about the fact that the exclusion principle reduces the phase space for scattering at the Fermi surface, he argued that you could turn on interactions adiabatically, and in so doing, there'd be a one-to-one -one correspondence of, with, between the excitations of the interacting system and the excitations of the non-interacting Fermi liquid. This then is the famous Landau quasi-particle. And uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, Landau went with this idea, he'd been thinking about it for a very long time before he published it, is it could be used to understand helium-3, the Fermi liquid, the Landau Fermi liquid, helium-3. One of the beautiful things about Landau theory is you can parameterize the interactions around the Fermi surface in terms of a small number of parameters that describe the angular dependence of the forward scattering. And, uh, and one of these is the, is the dipole interaction, which in Landau's theory determines the mass renormalization. And uh, this was used to understand the fact that from the linear specific heat capacity of E3, you get a mass renormalization of 2.8. Of course, generations thereafter have puzzled about Landau's use of the word adiabaticity because adiabaticity only works for gapless systems. In fact, we know from Landau's theory itself that this is not really adiabatic because the Landau Fermi liquid has collective modes that are absent in the Fermi liquid. And so clearly it does have excitations that are not in one-to-one -one correspondence with a non-interacting system. So the more modern understanding of this would be using ideas of renormalization group to understand this as a, as a stable or almost stable fixed point. Heavy fermion systems can be thought of as magnetically polarizable Landau Fermi liquids. In Landau's theory, you get a renormalization of the density of states, which determines the linear specific heat, and you get a renormalization of the susceptibility, and the ratio of the two involves only one interaction coefficient, f mod a, this is the so-called Wilson or Sommerfeld ratio. And what this does here is plot the rate gamma, the linear specific heat, versus chi, the heavy fermi, is on a log log, a log, a log, log scale. And uh, it's rather interesting to compare copper with copper with a little bit of cerium in it, known as cerium copper 6. Copper uh, is somewhere down here, has a gamma of about 1 minijoule per mole Kelvin squared. And if you look up here, here is cerium copper 6 up there. Uh, 
and it has a gamma of around 1,000 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. And so on the basis of this, the mass for normalization determined by the density of states is about 1,000. Some of that effective mass comes from band theory, probably a factor of 20, and that comes from band theory. But the remainder comes from interaction effects. And so it's rather remarkable that you can actually increase the mass by a factor of 20 or 1,000 or who knows what, and that the system is still a Landau Fermi liquid. And, uh, and uh, I like this picture just for fun. Um, is a picture taken in 1956. And uh, uh, this is Lev Landau here. This is Friedman Dyson. And uh, they discussed many things at this meeting. But one of the things that was learned was Landau's new Fermi liquid theory. And when Dyson came back to the Institute for Advanced Study, he gave a few lectures on Landau's Fermi liquid theory. And a young David Pines went and listened to those lectures. Um, there are other people that are interesting here. This is Anatoly Larkin. Here is Pomeranchuk. Here is Abrako a young Abrakozov. Um, Pomeranchuk, of course, realized that Fermi liquids could become unstable to changes in the Fermi surface shape, which we would now call pneumatics. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, uh, here comes the Terminator from the future. Uh, what happens become when the interaction becomes too large, of course, is one of the things that, uh, that uh, Ken Wilson was extremely interested in. And uh, of course, this question has concerned the community for a very long time. As you tune up the interaction, the Fermi liquid does seem to be stable to most things except superconductivity. Uh, but as you make it very strong, instabilities occur. Wigner was one of the first to realize that electrons can order. Paradoxically, in the electron gas, uh, the strength of interactions compared with the kinetic energy increases as you make the electron gas more dilute, and it ultimately forms a Wigner crystal. Lando also understood that this would lead to new forms of order, but other answers came along. Piles came up with this idea of the idea that, that you could convert hydrogen into a metal if you made it dense enough, and this then stimulated Mott to think about the, the, the physics of electron localization, now known as the Mott transition. Anderson, in the 60s, realized that electron localization was the origin of local moment formation. And then uh, a lot of discussion at this meeting about quantum critical points. And in the 1970s, many people were involved in discussing uh, quantum critical points. Uh, you'll hear the name John Hertz, but others, Sepdoniak, Schrieffer, were all very concerned about quantum fluctuations in ferromagnets near to the point of instability, near to the uh, the uh, um, stone instability. And this came to the idea of a quantum critical point and the notion that it transformed the nature of the Fermi liquid uh, in the region above it. And last but not least, uh, uh, Ken Wilson appreciated that you should think about low energy ground states in terms of new fixed points. And then on this side and this side, you maybe have stable fixed points, but at the quantum critical point, you have an unstable fixed point. And uh, uh, in the context of Doniak's phase diagram, this is then an unstable fixed point separating the antiferromagnet from the Fermi liquid. And since it's unstable, it can flow to new phases. The antiferromagnet or the Landau Fermi liquid being just two, but there may be other kinds of instability. There may be multipolar instabilities, the matrix, octopoles, hexadecapoles. Uh, there may be superconductors and states that we haven't yet even imagined that are out there. And so that's why we're very interested in, in unstable fixed points, even though, ironically, because they're unstable, we may never actually observe them. Yeah. Because they'll be covered by a dom. And it's, let me give you a few examples. So you can get new kinds of superconductor new kinds of insulator. One of the first heavy ferromagnet systems to be discovered was samarium hexaboride, discovered in the 1960s. Uh, and amusingly enough, it's only recently been realized it's probably a topological insulator, topological conduit insulator with a, a, a plateau in its resistivity at low temperatures due to surface excitations that are topological in character. 
Uh, you can have new kinds of electron order, and I probably won't get to talk about it, but one of my favorite topics is uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, which has an unusual normal state with a hidden order parameter. You will hear a lot about the, about the uh, surrogate phase of the cuprates, where there's a lot of suspicion there might be hidden forms of order. In the case of uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2, there's no doubt that there's a hidden order parameter. There's a huge specific heat anomaly, and yet the underlying nature of this order is unknown because no one's been able to detect the order parameter despite 30 years of trying to look for it. And, uh, and there are lots of ideas about this. Uh, one of the things that are interesting in this system is the mobile electrons are Ising-like. They have an Ising G factor. And we'd be very interested in the possibility that this may tell us something about the underlying hidden order parameter, which we think may be a spinorial order parameter. Okay. And uh, last but not least, this I will talk about. Here is Neptunium Palladium 5 Aluminium 2, uh, which has this remarkable uh, curious susceptibility all the way down to the point where it goes superconducting, which leads us to believe that the spin is entangling with the conduction electrons to form an order parameter. We think it's a single order parameter, and so the simplest way for this to occur is through composite pairing. We'll come back to that later. And new kinds of phase condition. I won't talk about the quantum critical points, uh, but that's a subject of great interest. In terbium, rhodium 2, silicon 2, there is a linear resistivity that develops at this unusual quantum critical point, which can be tuned with a magnetic field. Uh, it's been long assumed that this is an anti-ferromagnetic phase transition uh, separating uh, uh, a delocalized heavy electron phase from a localized heavy electron phase. Uh, and this linear resistivity goes all the way up to about 10 Kelvin, so it's right through the roof. Um, in fact, uh, recently it become, it's becoming more and more clear that this phase condition doesn't depend on the development of antiferromagnetism. It's a localization transition of some sort that can be separated from the antiferromagnetism. There's the linear resistivity going way, way up to about 10 Kelvin. Um, since I'm going to be delaying my discussion of superconductors, I'm going to really talk about the normal state. I want to whet your appetite with one example, one or two examples, probably just one example. Okay. And this is syrup indium 3, which um, actually was known to be an antiferromagnet since the early 70s. Um, and no one dreamt of it being anything terribly interesting. It's a 10 Kelvin anti-ferromagnet um, and uh, but with the notion that quantum criticality can lead to superconductivity this idea uh, was then followed by Lonzerich and co-workers at Cambridge and they put pressure on serum at indium 3 and when they did so they discovered that indeed as they expected TNAL went down and lo and behold a tiny 0.2 Kelvin superconductor was formed around the quantum critical point. This is 10 TC. If you were to actually draw this, it would just be a tiny, minute bump on this scale. Now you might think, well, that's interesting, but certainly not going to power the uh, energy demands of the future. Nevertheless, it turns out that this discovery stimulated a lot of discussion. Serum indium 3 was a cubic material, that's its structure. And uh, uh, stimulated by discussions coming out of high temperature superconductivity. In fact, uh, in 1999, Montu and Lonzerich proposed that if you could make a system like this more two-dimensional, then TC would go up. And this is basically because when you do a mean field theory of D-wave pairing around a two-dimensional Fermi surface, you do much better in the exponent. Uh, and so based on this, uh, discussions went on and uh, Zachary Fisk and co-workers said, well, that's a good idea. Let's make it more two-dimensional. Let's put in layers of uh, something, uh, indium something, in between cerium and indium-3. And so they came up with cerium rhodium indium-5, which is a 2-Kelvin antiferromagnet. And when you put pressure on that, that then forms a 2-Kelvin superconductor. In fact, this has been a subject of great discussion, this material. It's very reminiscent of cuprate superconductors, only in miniature. 
as you hit the quantum critical point, you get a beautiful linear resistivity. Uh, the superconducting dome extends into the antiferromagnet, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, it forms a homogeneously coexisting superconductor and antiferromagnet. Uh, this system still challenges us today, and I'll be coming back to discuss this more next time. But from serum rhodium indium 5, the question was, well, if you can put pressure on it, then maybe you can do chemical pressure. And if you replace rhodium by something else, such as cobalt, then maybe you'll be able to put that chemical pressure and drive it naturally into a superconductor. And lo and behold, that's what was discovered later. Serum cobalt indium 5 goes up to 2.5 Kelvin. And then, this is all in 2001, and then the idea was, why not replace the cerium by a 5F material? And when you do that, you have to mess around, and so you'll have to adjust the size of the indium atom. Let's go to gallium. And uh, experimentalists at Los Alamos then discovered plutonium cobalt gallium 5, which is an 18.5 Kelvin superconductor. Uh, and shortly thereafter, this 9 Kelvin rhodium gallium 5 superconductor. Um, and uh, 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 along the way, uh, more recently, by accident, neptunium aluminium palladium 5 was discovered. And if you look at the normal state of these systems, they, they all show these nice linear resistivities coming down. If you didn't know, you would you'd say maybe that's a high temperature superconductor, and it is. It's just rescaled. Okay? And the reason the TC goes up from cerium cobalt to plutonium is just the characteristic scale of the plutonium F electrons is 10 times larger than the 4F cerium F electrons. So if you look at the scaling that's gone on here, it's gone from 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Kelvin, up to basically 20 Kelvin. Two orders of magnitude increase in TC from the original material. If we could do that with transition metals, we'd be there today. Okay? Right? We have room temperature superconductor. So one of the questions is, why can you rescale like that in these systems? You can't do that, or it doesn't seem to work so well, in the oxides and the nictites. What's going wrong? We don't know the answer to that question. There are many systems that seem to display superconductivity at a quantum critical point, not just the heavy ferraments, which have both anti-ferromagnetic and ferromagnetic transitions. Iron-based superconductors, we'll be hearing more about that from Yuji Matsuda and others, and the cuprates you've already been hearing about. So, important points about heavy ferromagnetic material before we go on and start discussing the details. Okay? I just wrote down a whole bunch of them. Um, they're classic strongly correlated materials. So, good to study because they've influenced the field a lot. Of course, you might regard it as a little bit like studying Latin, interesting for historical reasons, but you can find the root cause of your ideas at the moment, but maybe not important for the big picture. However, that's not actually true, because these materials are still uh, giving us many new ideas. They, they've also given us many, many of the ideas you'll see around today, and for other materials, began with heavy electron materials, the gauge theory approach. And the notion that D-wave pairing is driven by anti-ferromagnets all grew out of the heavy fermion problem. There are many families of materials, a dizzying profusion of materials in these systems. If you're scared of looking at chemical compounds, this is terrifying. Um, uh, but in each of them, there are lots of interesting phenomena. They're easily synthesized, so experimentalists can make many of them very easily, and they continue to provide major surprises, such as topological condo insulators discovered in the last five years. They're highly tunable. You don't need 100 Tesla to kill a heavy Fermi superconductor. You only need 5 Tesla or 10 Tesla. So you can study things in miniature. It's a fruit fry or a bonsai superconductor. <coughs> uh, but they never share common behavior with high temperature, high TC materials. For example, there are many of them at near quantum critical points that exhibit strange metallic behavior with linear resistivity. Unlike one-band systems, these systems have a clean separation between the conduction and the spin degrees of freedom. And that's maybe useful in trying to separate the physics. And last but not least, uh, I mentioned this before, 
These are materials where the gauge theory approach uh, uh, to strongly correlated electrons is reasonably well established, albeit in describing systems which, uh, in describing the development of the heavy Fermi liquid, and, and not so good, and has not given us understanding of the strange metal. Okay. Is it time? If not, I've got a bit more time. I wanted to talk a little bit about the basic models of these materials. Um, yes. Yes. How do these materials uh, respond to dirt? Dirt? Like cuprates, they are very insensitive to dirt. All these samples are very crappy. But what if you make heavy fermions if you make bad samples? Do these properties disappear or these are well, it's, I think it's true in these systems as it is in cuprates that the cleaner you make them, the more you discover. Um, I think it's probably not true. I think it's probably true that there are many aspects of the cuprates that are hidden even today because we can't get rid of the junk. It's very difficult to make clean cuprate materials. Whereas in heavy films, it is the case that, that you see new things when you make them cleaner. However, having said that, some of them show a remarkable robustness of, for example, their superconductivity against junk. Um, uh, one of the things that, that, that is not well understood is the fact that if you dope on the F site where the local moment is, the superconductivity is only weakly affected. But if you dope on the conduction electron site and put junk there, it's radically affected. And so that's telling us something very important about the underlying pairing mechanism. Um, so um, uh, Yuji Matsuda, who's sitting there in the back, has recently discovered a remarkable Nernst effect in uranium ruthenium to silicon two, and as you improve the RRR from the old samples which are around 20 to the new samples which are around 800, this Nernst effect goes through the roof. Okay, so it's an example of an effect that's very sensitive to disorder. So I think the basic thing I would say is that although some of them are quite robust, you can never get them clean enough. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's good. Uh, yes. Uh, can I understand uh, the superconductivity in heavy, heavy, uh, heavy fermion as like a first they form a fermion liquid, then there is superconductivity instability, or because they uh, have since that happening, it seems that they happen at the same time, so it's a little bit ambiguous. Yeah, so, I, so perhaps I, I, have, I love bad actors, so I emphasize those cases where which which puzzle us the most. But there are examples of heavy fermion systems where, where, where superconductivity develops within a well-formed Fermi liquid. Mm -hmm. And in those cases, I think it's quite reasonable to say, look, I don't need to worry about how the heavy Fermi liquid formed. I just need to ask what the residual interactions are amongst these heavy electrons. Just like in helium-3, I don't need to worry about the fact that helium-3 is made of, of, of two electrons and many nucleons. You might argue in those cases you can forget about the internal structure of the heavy electron. And I think that's okay in those cases. But what we've been discovering is that in the highest TC systems, uh, of course, perhaps it's not surprising, as TC creeps up to becoming a large fraction of the bandwidth, then in those cases the quasi particle isn't well formed, and the internal structure and the nature of the normal state becomes a more important issue. So, if I've got a little bit of time, I wanted to just spend a bit of time talking about the, the various models that are used for understanding heavy fermions. And of course, um, if you're a purist, then you believe, as do the US Marines, that no electron should be left behind. <laughs> and this means that there's no model that's good enough for you. You have to have a model with every single detail involved in it. Okay. However, um, this then leads to a cascading sequence of models that capture some aspect, but not all aspects, of physics. And one model that uh, captures a lot of the basic physics, but is not simplified enough for our purposes, is the Anderson model. And the Anderson model is kind of like the alpha particle picture of electronic systems. The electrons in the D states or the F states of an Anderson model are localized inside an atomic potential well, but they can resonate with the conduction electrons, they can tunnel through that potential well into the conduction C, and that tunneling is described by the hybridization. In this case, I've assumed it's an F electron here. 
And then in such a simple model, there's also a repulsive U between two F electrons in a given orbital. This is the basic Anderson model. And uh, there are various things to say about it. The F state here, of course, is built up out of electrons themselves, but it's a core state. And what you do in putting together the Anderson model is that you orthogonalize the conduction electrons against this localized F state, and you then do the, the degenerate perturbation theory of that problem, and that gives you the Anderson model here, but then you have to add in the interaction, and that interaction is basically the Coulomb interaction between the two electrons in one shell here. This is a very simplified model, but this model already has in it the physics of the Condo model, and I wanted to go into, into the discussion of how the Condo model comes out of the Anderson model. So the atomic limit of this model is when you just turn off the conduction C. This is just then an ionic state. This is then the simplified atomic or ionic model. And it contains two states, two, three states. Uh, one empty state, one magnetic state, which has a crown of degeneracy, and one doubly occupied state. And of course, uh, there's a condition for when this system is magnetic, for this system to be magnetic, the F1 state has to be lower than the F0 state, so EF has to be negative. By contrast, the F2 state has to be larger than the F1 state, so U plus EF has to be greater than zero. And under those two criteria, you can rearrange this, just a little rearrangement here, that EF plus U over 2 is less than U over 2, and U over 2 is greater than minus EF plus U over 2. And that then gets the famous uh, phase diagram for the Anderson model, the atomic limit. There are three basic phases here, and the one we're interested in is the local moment phase here. For U positive, if you're in this re region here, the ground state is a local moment. And so if U is large enough, then you can forget about the F0 and F2 state, and you integrate those out, that then gives you the Condon model. How is that done? Let's look at that. This again is the atomic limit. Okay. And so uh, there will then be, when you embed this local moment into the conduction, see valence fluctuations between the F1 and the F0 state and the F1 and the F2 state. The characteristic scale of these excitations here might be several volts, might be half a volt, might be three volts. And so, if you're interested in physics from room temperature downwards, you want to integrate out those degrees of freedom. And this is what Schrieffer and Wolf did in the early 1960s. They discovered the link between the Condo model and the Anderson model. And they did so by integrating out the high frequency valence fluctuations, carrying out a canonical transformation that eliminates the high energy excitations. This is basically second order perturbation theory. You can do it in various different ways. But the important point is there's two excitations, one from F1 to F0, one from F1 to F2. And uh, one way of thinking about this is the following, is that uh, an electron can hop into an F1 state and form an F2 state, or a hole can hop into an F1 state and form an F0 state. These excitation processes are both very energetic, and they only occur when an electron scatters in a singlet state with the F electron. And so this means, from second order perturbation theory, that the energy of a CF singlet is reduced by an amount given by V squared over the excitation energy. When you work it out in detail, it's 2J. And so from the basis, on the basis of this, this, this then means the effective interaction will then be minus 2j times the projector into the singlet state, and that projector is given by something that involves minus sigma dot s, and so this then gives you the condo interaction. That's then the origin of this model. Another way of thinking about it is that you can write the condo interaction in the coblanche schrieffer form, which is very nice because you can kind of think of this as a virtual fluctuation which removes an F, which, which in, in this way of forming it, adds an F electron and removes it. And so J here is uh, is this quantity V squared over here. And we'll be coming back to this particular form of the interaction. This is then the Condonatis model. 
we've already discussed the Doniak hypothesis. Let me just mention the strong coupling condom lattice, which is the solvable limit of this model. If you assume that J scales to the strong coupling, or if your ground state is adiabatically connected to the strong coupling limit, well, one thing you can do is just look at the case I mentioned before, which is when you've got number of electrons equal to the number of spins, that's a condo insulator. You can uh, imagine doping that with electrons. This then forms an excited state of energy of order J, which is mobile, has a mobility of order, uh, a bandwidth of order T. And that then gives you an excited state of holes. This is a hole doped heavy electron state. Interestingly enough, if you think about that, this is actually some electron going in there. If you think about that, you could, it's rather similar to the case of the cuprates. The cuprates can be thought of in some sense as a strongly, a, a very large J heavy electron problem, of course, in which you've drained out almost all of the electrons. So here, uh, you can also pluck out an electron that's hole doping. You then have a mobile hole. And that then forms a state which we put down here. Uh, of course, if you can then take this insulating state and let J get smaller and smaller and smaller, and provide that gap doesn't ever close, then you've got an adiabatic link with this weakly coupled condo lattice. Of course, what happens to the characteristic scale is it will no longer be J, it will now be something much, much smaller. We need to understand that scale. Nevertheless, this provides some notion that the condo insulator is the mother compound of heavy fermions. So, uh, I have a question. So, yes. In reality, if you do one hole, it become a metal. So, in reality, is there actual condo insulator or? I mean, wait, wait. wait. If if you do, I mean, does this any an electron equals and spin is. When this is right, right, so the, the, the easiest way to do this would be to just pluck f electrons out, just replace them by a non magnetic site, and that does indeed start to drive the metallic. Although I must say that the details of the metal insulated transition right. of condo insulators is very poorly understood. Um, there is actually a, an iron based version of this called iron silicide, which can be thought of as a kind of condo insulator. Um, and uh, uh, the metal insulator transition of that system is, it, it is not like a conventional metal insulator transition of, say, phosphorus doped silicon. It's, it's very different mm -hmm. and not well understood uh, and seems to involve undiscreet and undiscreet condo effects. It's, it's understood, it is not well understood. Uh, as regards the other heavy electron systems, uh, um, you don't get a clean metal insulator transition in them, at least in the current experiments. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at the photon, if you look at the optical conductivity of a heavy electron metal and a heavy electron insulator, it's very, very similar. They differ only because in the, one has got a low energy Drude peak and the other one doesn't. They both have this indirect gap, which is no longer given by J, but is now given by a scale which is not the conda temperature, but the geometric mean of the conda temperature and the bandwidth. We'll discuss that next time. The other thing that's interesting here is that uh, when you uh, dope this system, the, uh, num the, you, you get a, a large Fermi surface. You can think of it as a large Fermi surface uh, because you start out with electrons, but you end up with a whole like Fermi surface. And, and with a bit of work, you can see that the uh, volume of the Fermi surface is 2 to the volume of the Fermi surface is 2 minus the doping. Uh, and that can be rewritten as the number of spins plus the number of electrons. So the Fermi surface somehow counts spins as charged quasi particles. And we'll come back to this uh, sort of Faradayan picture of the condo effect as kind of dissolved local moments in a conduction C. So I'm done for today. Thank you. Any more questions? Everyone's tired. Yes. Go ahead. So, you've made a comparison of the two plates and the heavy volume of the bottom of the So, my question is why the role played by spin only coupling? 
So, so what's the question about spin orbital coupling? What is the role of yeah. spin orbital coupling? Yeah. Yeah. It's huge in heavy electron systems. Uh, and uh, that's why you can't directly translate things that occur in F electron systems to D electron systems. So, um, for example, one of the things that, in the case of heavy electron systems, the Hund's coupling is more, sorry, the, the spin orbit coupling is much more important than the Hund's coupling. Uh, whereas in, F -elect in D electron systems, the Hund's coupling is, is very, very large. And so you get very different physics between the two. So the, the difference between, so, 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 orbital angular momentum is unquenched in F electron systems. Uh, whereas it's in some sense heavily quenched in transition metal systems, except in a few cases. Um, the other aspect that has become increasingly clear recently is that, is that uh, as you know, spin orbit coupling can be a driver for topological behavior in these systems. And so uh, these are good candidates in the insulating state for topological insulators. I haven't talked at all about the K and spin dependence of the hybridization. But that becomes extremely important. All the spin orbit coupling is built in to the hybridization of these systems. So as an electron comes in, it has to form this very high angular momentum state. Uh, and as a result of that, you see that there's a very strong angular dependence of the hybridization, which can have very important effects. Um, uh, so spin orbit coupling plays a very important role. Last but not least, it, it protects the degeneracy of the F states. So to a first approximation apart from crystal field splitting, they're very highly degenerate spin states. And so this has the effect of making the contact temperature much larger in these systems than in D-electron systems. Uh, and that's why you've got a much better chance of forming a condor lattice in an F-electron system than in a D-electron system. Uh, manganese has a very, very tiny condor temperature, and that's because of the Hund's coupling in the manganese. Whereas uh, you might have expected, if it worked for the Hund's coupling, to have a much, much bigger characteristic scale. The difference between titanium and manganese is entirely due to the Hund's coupling. Um, whereas in F-electron systems, the, the large, the, it's not the spin cup. J is a good quantum number to a first approximation. And so, apart from the crystal field coupling, you get a very large degeneracy, and this enhances the condo temperature. And so, whereas the Doniak phase diagram doesn't really make sense for D electron systems, it makes sense for F electron systems. Okay, I guess that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you.